Oh, you're still there? I want you to help me answer a really simple question that I ask all of my students at the very first lecture of introductory course in statistics. Are you ready? Do you have a pen and paper? Let's try to do this together. During the Second World War, US scientists completed a graph showing the marks where bullet penetration of the aircraft occurred during battles. The simple question that I ask my students is to mark areas on the plane where they think we should add armor to strengthen the plane design and make them more battle ready. And now, if your answer is here exactly where those areas where we can see the impact are, your answer is definitely wrong. But if you answered all the areas that are not marked in red dots, your answer is technically closer to the right answer. This is the famous example that statistician Abraham Wald discovered during the Second World War and made the whole US military rethink their defense strategies and mathematicians rethink the whole statistics and their hypothesis. And I would not be surprised if you knew answer to this question because this problem is part of many job interviews that require basic understanding of data. The answer to this conundrum is pretty simple. The damaged portions of returning planes show locations where they can still sustain damage and return home. Those hit in other places presumably do not survive. This data that you are seeing is from planes that returned home. The data that is missing is long gone at the bottom of the ocean where all fatally shot planes lie. But why I'm telling you all this? Because in our modern society we need to rethink the definition of success. We need to think what do we need to do to achieve our personal triumphs and why do I think that success and really famous people and the way we, uh, our perception works is inherently broken in our system. Hi. My name is Vladislav Radek, I'm writer and mathematician and this is Fabric of Life, a show where we try to fuse art and science to answer humanity's most difficult questions. And we use everything from complex statistics to classical paintings, from modern movies to neuroscience. And this week's question is relatively simple. Are you a successful person? And if not, what do you need to do to become one? What is the definition of success? Let me take you to the bottom of the ocean on an adventure. We love successful people and we will do anything to break the code of their accomplishments. And to follow success of people around us is natural instinct, but it can easily backfire if we don't take into account something that is really important in statistics, and that is survivorship bias. Here is a good example. I was talking recently with a good friend of mine, an amazing astrophotographer Eugene Kamenev, about success or lack thereof of my YouTube channel. He was perplexed that I come to create this immersive and rather expensive documentary shot all around the world just to get only a couple of hundred views in return. <laughs> Not really satisfying result, isn't it? As he understood it, every time when he landed on YouTube page, he was presented with hundreds of videos, most of them with not less than 10,000 views, some of them in millions, without clear explanation. Something even more extreme can be seen on new platforms like Instagram and TikTok. Okay. What the? What my friend Eugene didn't consider is everything that is not visible to a naked eye. All those planes lying at the very bottom of the ocean. My research suggests that before 2020 there were between 7 and 11 million active YouTube channels with less than 100 subscribers. During that pandemic the number probably doubled. This is 11 million people whose work you will never be able to see because YouTube's algorithm will never let you. An academic analysis of 36 million YouTube channels suggests the gap between the sites haves and have-nots. Just 0.4 of channels surveyed command the bulk of views, subscribers and pay. 
and like everything in life, it is impossible to see planes at the very bottom of the ocean. Once you're familiar with the idea of survivorship bias, you can spot it literally everywhere. For example, your gym might feature those who toned up quickly as a result to going to their facilities, but of course, they will never show those who signed up but achieved no more than a depleted bank account. And here comes the interesting part. A very subtle source of survivorship bias is when our society turns to very successful individuals who are plastered all over social media. Our attention is drawn to people who achieved success despite uh, betting against all odds and taking really big personal risks. For example, a number of today's billionaires, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, achieved their success despite never going or finishing university, a fact that has attracted considerable media attention. In 2018, the employment rate for graduate in US was 88%, while 72% for non-graduates. The median annual salary for graduate was $43,000 and only $30,000 for non-graduate. Although university isn't necessary to be rich, looking at the whole picture rather than just the survivors made it clear that it does help. But what media won't tell you is that there are hundreds of very similar companies that were started at the same time as, for example, Microsoft, and that old Billy used really shady tactics to crush the competition, while Max Zuck simply stole the idea. What we don't see is that the thousands of companies went bankrupt at the same time. So next time, when you watch a TED talk of celebrity founder who is acknowledging his, it's mostly his and never hers, determination and grit, don't forget that they are on the stage because they won, not because they were good. If you and your friends want to find a startup thinking you just need to read Michelle Obama's biography to become successful, maybe you should consult statistics. More than 90% of millions of startups fail every year. It would take you at least 10 brilliant ideas and 10 ridiculously successful funding rounds with decades of determinated work and hundreds of talented co-workers to up your chances of success. So now obviously you want to ask me, so what is the secret ingredient of success? And the answer, scientific one, is unfortunately just luck. In recent years, a number of studies and books, including those by risk analyst Nassim Taleb, investment strategist Michael Baubosin, and economist Robert Frank, has suggested that luck and opportunity may play a far greater role than we ever realized across a number of fields, including financial trading, business, sports, art, music, literature, and yes, science. Their argument is not that luck is everything, of course talent matters, instead data suggests that we miss out on really important piece of success picture if we only focus on personal characteristics in attempting to understand the, the determinants of success. The play of luck can be found everywhere. The country of region that you are born in will determine your luck in the specific field. Most of the successful actors in Hollywood are born within a radius of 100 miles of famous studios. The chance of becoming a CEO is influenced by your name or month of birth. People with easy to pronounce names are judged more positively than those with difficult to pronounce names and females with masculine sounding names are more successful in legal careers. And now we come to the point of my personal confession because I think we can uh, learn everything better from our personal stories and examples. And some of you might know me as a relatively or really successful writer, depends how you see it. And although I spend my whole life trying to fine tune my words in sentences to create novels that will inspire the world, one particular point in my life, I was thinking I got everything uh, with luck. When I was 15, and this is the true story, I uh, had an uh, accordion class because I was playing accordion, I went to music school, and uh, when I unpacked my bags and, you know, when I was ready uh, to play and spend the next 45 minutes practicing accordion with uh, my accordion teacher, she noticed a bunch of uh, little 
uh, um, sketchbooks and, and a lot of notes that fell out of my backpack and she asked me what it is and I shyly answered that this is uh, my first novel that I actually wrote in hand and she didn't laugh. She actually said something really interesting. Well, you probably know that uh, my husband is a famous novelist and if you think that you're ready, uh, maybe he can give it a try and read your novel. Obviously, I didn't expect anything and I went home and ran to my best friend Nicola. Hey Nicola, what's up? And uh, we sat down at his computer and retyped all 200 pages or so. And then I put it on a, on a, on a disk drive. You probably don't even know what it is. And I gave it uh, to a famous writer, probably expecting that he will never read it. Surprisingly enough, he came back with an answer in like 15 days or so saying that this needs to be published and he knows exactly the publisher that he's ready to listen to a 15 year old. Long story short, um, this happened um, some almost 20 years ago, um, some 150 pages that uh, later become a bestseller um, inspiring many uh, children and youth and teenagers across the country and world. This is the story of my success. History is cemetery for talented people that never got their recognition. We will never know how many unmarked graves are hiding works that are on par with Dostoevsky or Mozart. Not even tragic death is the guarantee for discovering talents and work post-mortem. So what should we do, you're probably going to ask me right now. And this is the time when I turn to classical literature to find some quote or a chapter that gives us a perfect answer. But I'm not going to do this today, because one modern psychology professor, Tom Gilovich, actually provides us with a perfect metaphor that describes everything what we need and that, you know, shows or shines the light on our society's asymmetry. When you're running or bicycling into the wind, you're very aware of it. You can just wait till the course turns around and you got the wind at your back. When that happens, you feel great, but then you forget about it very quickly. You're just not aware of the wind at your back. And that's just a fundamental feature of how our minds and how the world works. We're just going to be more aware of those barriers than of the things that boost us along. And this is why we should rethink our definition of success. We shouldn't look up to a people that already by chance achieved a success, trying to find a secret formula, but we should treasure people who are not looking for the world's praise for the work they do, people less fortunate than us, without any material compensation, put smiles on faces and uplifting people surrounding them. By that definition, being an egoistical tyrant on the top of the most destructive company on the planet, which is responsible for hundreds of teenage suicides a year with money that he will not be able to spend for next seven lives, looks like a failure to me. On the other hand, telling 200 people that everything is fine and that they are successful only if they help people less fortunate than they thrive is good enough for me. 200 people will watch this video and 200 people will stop worrying about the future and sometimes they will shift their priorities. Some of them might help others. For me, this is a huge success. Go on now. Let me read. Hey, Vladislav Radek again here, I hope you liked this episode of Fabric of Life. Let me know in comments down below what is your biggest personal success. Every week, don't forget I'm taking you on new and amazing adventures. Until next week, stay tuned and curious, and don't forget, libraries still exist.